Please welcome Dr. Angela Crutchfield, Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at Riverside. Hello everyone and welcome to Riverside Community Care's second annual lived experience event, lived experience of intersectionality. This event today is one of Riverside's three annual diversity and inclusion events aligned to cele celebrate and to acknowledge the various dimensions of diversity within our organization and that we know exists. Riverside is committed to being an organization that values every individual. The theme for today really gives a glimpse into you know, the thoughtfulness that we are, are putting into the consideration of all people. The lived experience of intersectionality is reflective of the multiple components that may include gender, race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, disability, religion. The intersecting and overlap of these social identifiers may be both challenging and empowering. This event today will provide each of you a better understanding of the life experiences of intersectionality and lived experience. The voice of lived experience can be reflective of significant diversity. And that diversity includes how family members may experience the lived experience of other family members. Riverside's president, Vicar DeGravio, is joining us today to share his personal lived experience. <clears throat> As president of Riverside, Vic is responsible for strategic direction, organizational planning in response to funding opportunities and community needs and advising on service delivery and overall strategy, mission and marketing. And that's a lot of responsibility for a leader, but that doesn't negate the fact that we all have lived experience. Vic demonstrates consistent support of our diversity and inclusion efforts, and he places great value on the opportunity to share with you today his lived experience. Please welcome Riverside's president, Vicar DeGravia. Good morning. Oh, um, Angela, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's really an honor to be part of today's program and, and to be able to share my story with you. Um, full disclosure, when we were uh, discussing this last week, Angela really encouraged me not to read um, my remarks, to, to speak from the heart, and, and I'm certainly going to try to do that today. But it, in all honesty, some of the stuff I'm talking about, if I don't actually read the comments, it will be hard for me to get through. So um, if it appears that I'm just kind of reading from the script, please know that's part of my way of being able to share my story without um, getting too emotional. So um, my story really is familiar to anyone who has watched a loved one struggle with mental health and addiction issues. Uh, it's about my father, who unfortunately passed away from cancer almost 25 years ago. My dad, Victor Gravio Jr., was in almost every way, a great father to my sister and me. He was utterly devoted to us. And he was somebody who every single day of his life really never failed to convey how proud he was of me or, or my sister and my mom. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, he taught my sister and me a great deal, great lessons about treating those less fortunate with compassion and kindness. And really some of those less, lessons are the reason why I'm at Riverside today. Um, for most of my life, my father owned and operated a neighborhood bar room um, type of place that opened at 8 a.m. And it was not unusual to have folks coming in the door at 801 looking for a drink. Um, and not surprisingly, it was a place that attracted a lot of people um, who struggled with addiction and mental illness. Uh, inevitably, my father would bring some of those folks home with them to share family holidays, such as Thanksgiving and Christmas, because he felt so strongly that nobody should ever be alone on a holiday. Uh, and I, I have to admit, as a kid, it was sometimes disconcerting to be at the 
the Thanksgiving dinner table, the Christmas dinner table, and have folks around the table who, in retrospect, clearly were struggling with their mental health. Um, but again, my father just thought that that was the right thing to do. And, and that was a lesson that my sister and I really absorbed really early in life. Um, my father, though, was an alcoholic. Um, he was a functioning alcoholic, but he was an alcoholic. Um, and it was something that I understood very early on. My mother was open discussing my father's alcoholism with my sister and me. Um, and this was 50 years ago, but she taught us even back then that alcoholism was a disease, just like cancer, and that my father's alcoholism didn't make him a bad or a weak person and certainly didn't mean that he didn't love us. But at the same time, my mother realized she needed to protect us from the really bad effects of my father's drinking. Um, as many of you know, understanding that addiction is a disease is one thing. Living with its daily impact is an entirely different thing. Uh, there were numerous times when we were little, my mother would take us to her grandmother's house for a night or two just to get us away from my father and his drinking and the impact of his drinking. Um, and eventually our home life became so chaotic uh, that my mother divorced my father. Uh, and that was when I was seven and my, my sister was five. But in an unusual and really cool twist, um, my parents reunited and were remarried three years later. Um, I still, it's still one of the best moments of my life. Clearly remember them telling me that they were going to get, telling my sister, I mean, they were going to be remarried um, and just how incredibly happy I felt at, at that point in time. Um, it wasn't a total shock because my father had remained a constant presence in our lives throughout their divorce. And he, to his credit, worked really hard to gain some control of his life. Um, and he was able to stabilize his drinking to a point and his employment to a point where my mother felt confident that we could move forward as a family. That was in 1976. And from that point until the day he died 23 years later, my parents lived together um, very much in love but not without significant struggles related to my father's ongoing drinking. Uh, and, and that was true for my sister and me and, and um, throughout the rest of our school years and living at home and when we left and went to college and into our, uh, our adulthood and when we started our own families. Um, and for my sister and me, our lives were impacted in all the same ways children of alcoholics are impacted. Um, my father got up and went to work every day. And even though we worked at a bar, we wouldn't actually not drink during the work day. But almost every day or night, he would come home um, after spending time with his friends, friends drunk. And there were certainly times and there were many times when his drinking was of a source of embarrassment to my mother and my sister and me, even after my parents had reunited and, and um, we had... Um, reunited as a family. But what I didn't understand at the time, and even through adulthood, was that in addition to my father being an alcoholic, that he was most likely suffering from severe depression. Um, and, and none of us at the time understood that his frequent bursts of anger were most likely a symptom of his untreated depression. We thought his anger was fueled by his drinking um, and not appreciating that most likely his drinking and his anger were actually a byproduct of his depression. I'm not a clinician. Those of you that know me know that. Um, and my understanding of clinical issues is what I've learned from working with clinicians over the past 17 years in our field. Um, but what I've learned about the intersection of mental illness and addiction has allowed me to better understand my father's struggles throughout his life. And, um, and with that understanding, some forgiveness as well. Um, and while I'm glad that I have a better understanding of all the factors that impacted my father and our family, I'm also incredibly sad 
that I didn't understand then what I understand now. Um, I wish more than anything that I could go back in time knowing what I now know about mental health and co-occurring disorders and how mental illness impacts addiction. Um, I'm not sure, honestly, if this understanding could have helped me help my father more than I did when he was alive. But I would give almost anything to have that opportunity. Because I know he deserved much better than he got. And so did my mother, my sister, and me. Um, so th that's my story. Thank you very much for allowing me to share it with you. Um, and it, it's just, it's really an honor to be part of the program today. So thank you. Please welcome Amy Sika, Director of Recovery and Peer Services at Riverside. Thank you, Vic, for sharing such a personal aspect of your life. I have no doubt that your father is so proud of who you are and all the work that you do. There are so many of us within Riverside and beyond with various situations reflective of lived experience. But with that, we also recognize that many people joining today may not be part of the Riverside community or they just may not be familiar with that term. Here at Riverside, we have team members who are individuals who have had to let navigate life on life's terms. This could be with mental wellness, substance use, neurodivergency, or supporting a loved one. These are team members who have often completed training to encourage, motivate, and to support a person receiving service on the basis of mutuality. But also as Vic's story shows, we like to highlight that many people identify as somebody with lived experience, not just people working in these unique roles. That doesn't deserve to just be recognized, that deserves to be honored and celebrated. As executive sponsor of Riverside's Power of Lived Experience, or Poll ERG, I have the opportunity to have interaction and regular dialogue, not just about the importance of educating others on lived experience, but to create a safe space for people who identify as such. A part of understanding this is understanding how the dimensions of diversity for so many converge, resulting in the lived, ex lived experience of intersectionality. <clears throat> so many live in a world of everything, everywhere, all at once. Someone who is black, female, bisexual, living with depression, that is intersectionality. Someone who is in recovery, living with anxiety and of Asian descent, that is also intersectionality. Someone who is gay may have to deal with homophobia. Someone who is black may have to deal with racism, but a gay black man will have to deal with homophobia and racism. Intersectionality recognizes that identity indicators may not exist independently of each other. Just with those examples, we can see that there are so many variations to intersectionality. A member of Riverside's Power of Lived Experience Employee Resource Group, Tamia McCauley, is here to provide real life examples of such. Tamia works at Riverside's Trauma Center and she is also a certified peer specialist working under Riverside's Adult Community Clinical Services Program. Please welcome Tamia as she shares her experiences about the intersectionality of her own personal life. Thank you, Amy. Hi, my name is Tamia, and I'm a person who faces the challenges of depression. I'm a former consumer of one of Riverside State treatment programs. I am a full-time working strong black woman living with depression. I currently work in the trauma center and I'm a certified peer specialist working in the ACCS program. I work hard every day to keep my depression at bay and to assist others to navigate their way through recovery and the mental health system. As a black woman living with depression and coming from a, a black community, I was told that you just need to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and what happens in the home stays in the home. If my mom and other single moms in my family raising kids and working on their own can do it, so why couldn't I? I was also told that crying is a sign of weakness, so therapy wasn't in my vocabulary. While battling my depression, I relied heavily on my faith. But then, later in high school, I made my first attempt to try to end my life. I felt that my father, my friends, my God, all abandoned me. I felt so alone and unworthy of being loved. I had no self-esteem and no self-worth. 
This was when I started looking for help through any way I could. I met a black female guidance counselor who would sit with me for hours and help me see that these feelings that I had were normal. But when I would go home though, I would become withdrawn because these emotions and challenges were not normal to my family. We did not talk about this. It took me several years before I would be, find a good therapist and even longer for me to open up without feeling guilty for betraying my family and family secrets. It was very hard being the white sheep of the family. And I call myself the white sheep of the family because I went against the norm and was able to normalize what I was going through when my family didn't recognize these challenges. I went to college and was the first one to go in my family. The school I attended was a predominantly white all girls school. Being one of the few black women in school, I felt alone and out of place. There wasn't a lot of people in this community that resembled me. So I didn't feel that I had a lot of support. I started to isolate and had a re reoccurrence and the depression came back stronger than ever. So did the suicide attempts. At this point, I had to leave school during, during uh, excuse me, I had to leave school due, due to being hospitalized. I thought that this would be the end of my dreams, but I was determined to finish school and was able to return and graduate with my bachelor's degree. Five years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I thought for sure this was going to take me out, but I survived that too. I found that my strength was powerful and deeply embedded in me. My family wasn't there for me, nor did they support me during my battle with depression, the way they rallied around me during the battle with cancer. My family believed that depression and mental health challenges were all in my head and didn't recognize the challenges I faced was and is a real thing. I found it disappointing that my family didn't support me through depression the way they did when I had a physical illness, but I loved them deeply. I found out that through all my struggles combined with my depression, that I'm a survivor. I recently married the man I love and who loves me unconditionally despite my mental health challenges. My faith gives me the strength to fight. My faith is my rock. My circle is unwavering. My surrogate family, my therapist, my psychopharmacologist, my husband, and all of my friends all complete my circle. I found and labeled the strength I had in me. It's called perseverance. I also learned that I could live with bipolar too and still have self-worth and be funny, confident, and most importantly, loved. I am a strong and resilient black woman with a journey that is still under construction, but I am a conqueror. Thank you for inviting me and listening to my journey. Thank you, Tamia, for sharing your powerful story. We are truly impressed by your strength, candor, and perseverance. Observed each October, National Disability Employment Awareness Month, NDEAM, celebrates the contributions of America's workers with disabilities. Here in Massachusetts, there is an incredible school that supports the work and life skills of individuals with disabilities. With music as its core approach, Berkshire Hills Music Academy, BHMA, is a unique college-like program for young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Founded by a group of dedicated parents and professionals, BHMA uses a comprehensive program centered around music to help individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities advance their communication and employment skills, leading to increased independence. Joining us today in celebration of NDEAM and a demonstration of musical intersectionality is one of BHMA's ensembles. Musical ensembles are collaborative music experiences designed to teach participants how to be in a band, listen to one another, and channel their creative energy. Please enjoy the musical stylings of BHMA's classical ensemble as they share the song Spoon River.
please welcome Paula Fulton, Chief Human Resources Officer at Riverside. Thank you for that great song, BHMA Classical Ensemble. The interconnection of musical instruments and the notes of each musician plays is really symbolic of the theme for today's event. Everything, everywhere, all at once. When it all comes together, we value the output of the sound. We value the voice of all staff, including those who reflect intersectionality. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to take a moment to talk about Riverside's commitment to valuing and embracing differences and the trainings and opportunities we offer around it. Starting at new employee or orientation, we discuss Riverside's mutual respect policy, which states our steadfast goal to create and sustain a safe, respectful and welcoming environment where we can work collaboratively while valuing and respecting each other. New managers undergo DNI training, and then throughout the year, we offer multiple trainings that speak to intersectionality, such as Dr. Angela's popular workshop, valuing differences and understanding team dynamics. We also hold events like this throughout the year, incorporating many different perspectives. As an organization, we recognize that creating an environment that embraces and leverages the dimensions of diversity not only creates a stronger workplace, but helps us achieve our mission. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Ivy Watts. Ivy is a former All-American student athlete who appeared to have it all together, graduating summa cum laude and a top 30 finalist for the NCAA Woman of the Year Award. But on the inside, struggled with daily with, with daily with anxiety, self-worth, and depression. Growing up in a Black family, Ivy only believed the stigma around mental health, which led her to struggle in silence. After finally seeking help, Ivy, who is mental health first aid certified, promotes mental wellness and reduces stigma around mental health by sharing her story through public speaking in her blog, Beautifully Simply You. Ivy empowers others to speak their truth, know that they are not alone, learn the beauty of self-love and find strength to keep fighting for their tomorrows. Ivy is also the author of You Are Worth Fighting For, a book that will help you find tools for mental wellness, self-care, and self-love. Ivy has her undergrad in psychology from the University of New Haven and her master's in public health from Boston University. Ivy has empowered over 50,000 students and administrators, coaches, parents, and employees to practice mental wellness for themselves and for others. And perhaps no most notably, Ivy worked in Riverside's quality management department a handful of years ago. Over to you, Ivy. Awesome, thank you so much, Paulo, for that incredible introduction. And hello, everybody. I'm so honored to be here today to share my story and my struggle with my mental health. And yes, I worked with Riverside from 2015 to 2017, and it's just such an incredible opportunity to be back here with all of you today. Awesome, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into my story. So my struggle with my mental health started when I was just a young girl. I struggled a lot with anxiety and negative self-talk, but I never knew what that even meant or that I could even talk about my mental health because growing up in a Black family, I was afraid to talk about my mental health because we never talked about it. And I heard language from my dad of things like to suck it up or to walk it off for physical issues and emotional issues. And so for me, from a young age, I learned that I didn't have a voice, that I couldn't talk about whatever it is that I was feeling. And I didn't know what that feeling was, but I know that I was always struggling with a lot of physical health issues, a lot of stomach aches and headaches and trembling issues. But I never knew that that was my body's way of telling me that I was struggling mentally. I would spend hours upon hours in the doctor's office trying to figure out what was going on with me physically, but we could never figure out anything that was going on. This was my body's way of telling me that that anxiety was starting to build up within me, but I never knew that I could talk about it. So I struggled and struggled in silence with my mental health for most of my life. And I had a perfectionist mindset growing up as well. I always told myself that I needed to be perfect or that I was going to be falling short. My parents would always award me financially if I got all A's and a little bit less if I got A's and B's. So I learned from a young age that I would receive and get love if I was perfect. And if I was not perfect, then I would get less love and I would get less acceptance. And so I was seeking out perfection in all areas of my life. 
And so I was constantly feeling like I was falling short and that I wasn't good enough. And so I was struggling so deeply in silence because society told me, my culture told me that if I talked about what I was going through, that I would be labeled as weak and I needed the world to see me as perfect. So I struggled with that mental health and silence and said that it was safer for me to keep it all on the inside. And I'd love to have some interaction today. I know there's been so much great interaction already going on in the chat box. And I wanna ask you all to do a virtual show of hands with me and going into the chat box and putting an exclamation point, if you've also felt that same fear that I felt, that fear that you're afraid to talk about what you are going through because you're afraid of being labeled as weak by your family members, by your colleagues, your kids, you're afraid that you're gonna be a burden on somebody else. So instead you just said, it's gonna be easier for me to keep it all on the inside. I see so many exclamation points coming into the chat box. So I wanna applaud you all for being vulnerable and also sharing in a way your own lived experience. So recognizing that so many of us feel that fear, that fear comes directly from the stigma and our identities and our different cultures and our experiences has shaped the beliefs that we have around mental health, what we've heard when we were growing up. And so that stigma often communicates to us that if we talk about what we're going through, will be labeled as weak or crazy or lazy or dangerous. And so we don't want those negative terms on us. So we decide that we're not going to talk about our mental health. And that's exactly what I did. When we do that, our mental health problems only grow and grow and grow. And my mental health problems continued to grow as I got into middle school. I grew up in Massachusetts and I grew up in Waltham. And in my neighborhood, it was an all white neighborhood. And so when I got to middle school, it was really exciting to be around more of my black peers. But although it was also exciting, it was also really difficult for me because this is the first time that I started to be bullied and teased about the way that I looked and walked and talked and dressed. I was told by both my black peers and my white peers that I wasn't black enough. And so because I had this perfectionist mindset, I internalized that, that I wasn't good enough. I felt like I was falling short. I felt like that failure. And I felt like I couldn't relate to anybody. I couldn't relate to my black peers. I couldn't relate to my white peers. I didn't feel safe or comfortable in my own skin. I didn't know who I was and I didn't really like that person much either. And I remember I tried to change the way that I walked and talked and dressed and can specifically remember walking into the cafeteria, hiding my lunch behind my back because I was terrified that I was going to be labeled and judged for what I had, my mom had packed me for me for that lunch that day. And my struggle continued to grow with this anxiety and self-hate and negative self-talk from this young age and continued into high school and college. I was a student athlete for most of my life and I ran track in high school and college. When I got to college at University of New Haven, I had an all black coaching staff, which again was really exciting, but came with its own set of challenges as well, where they all came in with their own stigma as well from their families and our culture. And I just remember so desperately wanting someone to see me and to see the struggles that I was having and to see that I wasn't reaching my goals, not just because of a physical health sense, but because of my mental health and how I was struggling. But we never talked about anything emotional. We never talked about our mental health. We were always focusing on meeting the athletic goals that we had for ourselves. There was so much pressure and expectations of being a student athlete. And I really crumbled underneath that pressure because I was constantly so terrified of falling short of those standards. And because I never had the tools to work through the anxiety that I grew up with and the stigma that I grew up with, I never had the tools to work through any of those things. And so that pressure only made that anxiety and fear a lot worse for me. And because of the fear that I had, because of the anxiety I had, and because of the perfectionist mindset I had, my coaches put a lot of pressure on me to run a specific goal, which was to run 54 seconds in the 400 meter dash. And so I deemed that time as being perfect and I poured my self-worth into being that time, into running that time. And every single time that I got to a meet and got into the blocks ready to run this race, I can just remember this intense fear coming through me and me thinking to myself, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Despite all of the hard work that I had put in in a physical health sense, my mental health was struggling so much that anxiety told me that I wasn't worthy or capable of reaching that goal. And so I didn't reach that goal. And it became this really vicious cycle for me where that anxiety and fear just fueled me not reaching those goals. And that only fueled the negative self-talk and the self-hate and just continued to grow the anxiety. And I remember specifically also having a teammate who I was sitting in the car with her. And she mentioned to me that people who take their own lives by suicide are selfish. 
this was a teammate that I looked up to. And she was also a black team, a black teammate on my team. And so for me, because I looked up to her so much and she was saying something so negative and stigmatizing about a feeling that I was having, struggling so much with not knowing who I was and not liking myself and questioning my value on this earth. For me, that only added to the stigma and only added for me to struggle in silence when I so desperately just wanted someone to see me and to see the struggle that I was having. But nobody did really see that struggle because on the outside, they just saw me as this perfect person because that's really what I fought so hard for the world to see me as. I wanted everyone to see me as perfect. And so they saw that I was graduating from college in 2015 with a near perfect GPA, just like they saw that in high school and in middle school. They saw that I was all American in the four by 400 and that I was about to be named a top 30 finalist for the NCAA Woman of the Year Award. These really great accomplishments throughout my life that to me didn't really mean anything because I felt like I was leaving college and my life as a failure because I hadn't done the one thing that my coaches and teammates and family members had put so much pressure on me to do. I, I didn't run that 54 seconds in the 400 that I deemed as perfect. I had also poured my entire identity into being a track athlete. To this day, when I see people I haven't seen in a long time, they'll say, oh yeah, Ivy, the track star. And I also had that identity for myself. And so because of that, when I was graduating from college and not continuing on with my track career, I was losing my identity, the one identity that I had because I never felt safe in my skin. I didn't know who I could relate to. So athletics and being a track athlete was the one thing that I felt like I really related to in my identity. And I was losing that when I was graduating from college. And I started spiraling into a depression because I truly didn't know who I was. And I did not like whoever I didn't know who I was in that moment. I really hated myself and felt like an absolute failure for all the things I didn't do that were perfect in my life. And so then I started struggling more with thoughts of not wanting to be here and suicidal ideation. And it wasn't until a couple of years after college that I was finally able to get the help for myself. And in between that time, 2015, I graduated from college, I started working at Riverside. And I always think back of how I even graduated with a psychology degree and I'm learning about mental health and I'm learning about therapy and I'm doing the work at Riverside and trying to improve uh, the, the work that you're, we're doing with the clients that you're working with. And I'm trying to do all of this work and it just couldn't be me that would struggle. I always just said, it's somebody else's problem. It cannot be me. Again, that stigma that I grew up with was just speaking so loudly to me, despite these other positive influences in my life that were trying to advocate for me and promote for me to reach out for the help that I so desperately needed. But it wasn't until I had a friend, a former teammate, open up to me about her struggle with her mental health. And she told me that she was getting help for her mental health. This was huge for me because I never thought that she could be somebody that could struggle. And so for me, this was the first time that I ever had a conversation that I felt like I could relate to somebody and that it really broke down the walls of stigma that I grew up believing. And I didn't know if therapy could be helpful for me, but I knew that I didn't wanna be so stuck in the pain that I had been in for most of my life. And so this was the first time that I ever felt encouraged to walk into the doors of therapy. Leaving that lunch date with my friend, I remember calling my mom who, although she didn't know the depths of my mental health struggle, she knew at the surface that I'd all, I was always just a really stressed out kid. And I remember I made a really scary phone call towards to her and I was terrified of picking up the phone and calling her. But it was the most important phone call for me to make and for me to tell her, mom, I'm thinking about going to therapy. And she welcomed me with open arms and she said to me what I think she probably would have wanted to say to me my entire life. Of, I think that would be a great idea for you. And so that really helped to break that stigma and solidified for me that I could take that next step and really helping me to get the help that I wish I had gotten when I was just a young girl. And no, my problems wouldn't have gone away if I had gotten that help, but I would have had the tools to work through those problems a little bit easier. And so I started to learn tools for self-care and self-love through therapy and really learn to find my identities and to see that I had so many different identities and that not one thing had to shape me and I didn't have to pour my self-worth into one thing about myself and to really just accept myself and be patient with myself on my journey. And it was so huge for me in my healing. And I was able to finally see that I have a voice and that society has it all wrong. The culture that I grew up believing around mental health has it all wrong. Talking about what you're going through is not a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of strength. 
because you recognize that you want and deserve more and that you can't do that alone. And that's what I was so incredibly grateful that I was able to find the power of my voice and getting those things off my chest that had been draining me for my entire life and allow me to really start my healing journey. But even though I got to this really great space of self-love and self-care, I won't lie and say that mental health recovery isn't a process because it is. Our mental health journeys are not going to be linear. They're going to be up and down and all around. We're going to have really, really great days. We're going to also have really, really tough days. But both of those days are only helping us to grow in strength and resiliency. And that's going to help us through our future difficult days that we're inevitably going to have. I still struggle with my mental health. A couple of years after I started getting help for myself, my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. During that time, I struggled so much with depression, losing myself, that identity I felt like I had built up, losing myself, feeling like the strongest thing I could do was to be silent and be strong for her. But I had to remind myself that the strongest thing that I could do is talk to her about my fears and have that moment where we would both break down and cry together. And that was what was so healing for the both of us because she needed that as well. And then I lost my mom in 2021 and she was always my biggest supporter and my best friend. And that has been so challenging for me still to this day, something I'll struggle with forever. I become a new mom around the same time, unfortunately, that I lost my mom, which has been really challenging for me, struggling with postpartum mental health challenges, sitting in my car one day and actually wishing that I would never come back and just could drive somewhere and not come back because I did not want to, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, what motherhood was going to be. So I've had these challenges and I still struggle with anxiety and negative self-talk and depression. I struggled with these things my entire life. So they don't go away overnight. So I want all of us to know though, that that's okay. It's not about reaching a destination of happiness. It's about learning to love and accept ourselves for the person that we are in this moment and giving ourselves the same patience and grace and kindness that we so easily give to a friend or colleague who's struggling with something similar. And that's what I wish I had done for myself earlier in life. And now I know that I'm going to have challenges and hard times and changes in my life like I'm going through right now, but I know that I can give myself more grace through it. And I know that I have incredible therapists to help me through these challenging times. And I want all of you to know as well, the messages that I wish I had heard, that you have all of the tools and strengths within you and the resources and supports around you to keep putting that one foot in front of the other. And to know that if you're coming into this space and you're feeling overwhelmed or sad or frustrated or anxious, to know that that's okay, but to always know that you have a voice and it's the strongest thing that you can do to reach out and say that you need help. So knowing it's okay to not be okay, but it's also more than okay to reach out for help and to do something for it. And to know that there is always, always light within the darkness, no matter what struggle you might be having right now or in the future and that you, as you are in this moment, are worth fighting for. And so as I share my story and my struggles throughout my life of being a Black female, Black female student athlete who looked like I had it all together but was struggling so much underneath the surface, and now sharing my story, you might be thinking right now about your own story and maybe what you can do to help yourself to feel less stuck in the pain that you're having. And so I want to give you all a tool or two today that you can take away with you. Again, tools that I wish I had when I was struggling. And these tools, again, aren't going to always take away all of the struggles that you're having, but they're going to help you to move through them a little bit easier. So knowing no matter what you've experienced in your life, no matter what identities have shaped you, no matter what identities you're still trying to figure out throughout your life and knowing that that can change and just knowing that you matter, your story matters, your voice matters simply because you matter as you are in this moment. And so what I wanna do is give you all this tool called Emotional Freedom Technique Tapping. If you've never heard of it, I hope that you are excited for a treat because it's a form of meditation, but I love it because you can take it with you anywhere, anytime as a really great way to break down any struggles you might be having, anxiety, overwhelm, sadness. A link just got dropped in the chat if you wanna find out some more about like the history of it, um, as well as take away to do it on your own. But today I'd love for us to practice it together. So emotional freedom technique tapping or EFT tapping focuses on those 10 different energy points in your body. When you tap on them, not only does it help to reduce the negative feelings in your body, but it also helps to send positive messages to your brain. It can be a really great way to have a, a moment of mindfulness as well as giving yourself a space to have positivity and self-love in your world. 
So I'm going to share with you how EFT tapping works. The biggest thing is you want to identify the issue. So maybe you're having a hard time juggling all of the tasks on your plate as it relates to your work and your family life, financial struggles you might be having. Maybe you're really struggling about the desire to succeed and to be perfect in your career. Uh, maybe you're sad about a loved one and their health issues that they're struggling with right now or what's going on in the world. Whatever it is that your issue is, you want to identify that and know that what you're going through is valid and important. And then measure the intensity, how much it's bothering you from zero to 10. The reason why this is important is because if you go and you do some tapping or take a walk or do some yoga, that problem that you have, maybe it's a big project you're working on, is still going to be there. But what tapping or any other self-care tool does do is it gives you the grace and the space to move through it a little bit easier, keep putting that one foot in front of the other and knowing that you are worthy of doing so. And then you wanna take the issue that you have and you're gonna add it to an affirmation. So you're recognizing that what you're going through is important, just like all of your feelings are, but that also that you are worthy of love and acceptance from others and from yourself. So for example, you might say, even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. So what we're gonna do today is we're going to do this activity together. And even if this seems a little strange or superficial to you, if you've never done it before, I really, really hope that you can have this mindful moment with me because I love this tool. It's been so helpful in the journey with grieving my mom. It's been really helpful for me and anytime I have negative self-talk. And so I really just love it because you can take it with you anywhere, anytime. And I hope that you can take it with you as well. So today, the way that it's gonna work is I'm going to say the affirmation and you're just gonna focus on the tapping. The affirmation today is super general and that's okay. Even if you're not particularly anxious right now about the future, you can still get a lot of healing benefit out of this activity to get today. And then also you can take this in the future and make it your own. So you can change anxious about to frustrated, to sad in the future, to whatever you're feeling. The way that it works is you're gonna take the hand that you typically write with to do all of the tapping. So if you're a righty, use your right hand. If you're a lefty, use your left hand. That's the hand you'll use to do all of the tapping. As we go through, I'm going to ask that you find one of the 10 tapping areas that stands out to you as the most healing or calming, and I'll explain why afterwards. I'm going to close my eyes for this. I need the extra dose of self-care, and it helps me when I have my eyes closed. Feel free to do whatever you want. I'll use my voice to talk you through. So I really hope you have this mindful, meditative moment with me and practicing EFT tapping. For this first one, you're going to actually need both hands. You're gonna be tapping on the outside of your non-dominant hand. So if you're a righty, you're gonna tap on the outside of your left. Lefty, you're gonna tap on the outside of your right. All right, I'm gonna close my eyes and begin with the affirmation. And I welcome you to have this moment with me. So even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. Amazing, now you're gonna take that hand you write with in between your eyebrows and tap there. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. The next is outside of your eyebrow. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. The next is underneath your eye. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. The next is my personal favorite, but again, just take note of which one feels the most calming or healing to you underneath your nose. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. Your chin is next. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. Next is your opposite collarbone. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. The next, you're gonna raise your opposite arm up into the air and you're gonna tap right underneath your arm. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. Next, you're gonna take your hand on top of your head. Even though I'm anxious about the future, I still deeply love and accept myself. And finally, you're gonna take all of your fingers, you're gonna tap the tips of your fingers together. Even though I'm anxious about the future, 
I still deeply love and accept myself. Awesome. You can go ahead and open your eyes if you chose to close them. And I hope you just take a moment to lock in some of that healing energy that you hopefully just created within your body. And again, I love this tool because you can take it with you anywhere, anytime. And I mentioned as we went through, if you were to find the one of the 10 areas that stood out for you as the being the most calming or healing. And I'd love if you could put that into the chat box and, and I'll explain why. Um, because you might be in a space where you might not remember all 10 of the areas, or you might not remember the affirmation. You might not have time to go through the whole practice. But if you just have that one area, and then again, if, if anybody, if it stood out to you, if there's one area, go ahead and put that in the chat. If you just have that one area, you can take that one area for you and you can do that. And that can still have a lot of healing benefit for you. I see a lot of people going into the chat box right now. And so for me, my one area right before I came on to take my camera off and be here with you all is as tapping just right here, right? I didn't have time to go through the entire sequence, but other times you might need to, or you might have the time to. So just knowing you can take that one space with you and that can still have a lot of benefit for you. So knowing that if you have the different identities that have shaped you that have maybe made you think that you have to struggle in silence or not talk about your mental health. This can be a really great tool to do that can be really helpful that oftentimes is discreet. You can just be tapping your fingers, right? And so just recognizing that you can take care of yourself and you don't have to wait for your mental health problems to get really big to start pouring into yourself and knowing that you are worthy of doing so. So take this tool with you. The only one I would say to not do anywhere, anytime is the tips of your fingers when you're driving, but everything else is pretty much fair game. Awesome. So the final self-care tool that I want to share with you all today is the power of self-love and positivity. So often we go through our days and we will tell ourselves that we are not good enough, that we are not worthy or capable of reaching our goals, that we are failures. When we say those things to ourselves, our mind and our body believe it. And I understand that because I spent most of my life feeling so negative about myself and it impacted the way that I viewed myself. It impacted the way I carried myself and it impacted the goals that I wasn't able to reach, that I wanted to, that I unfortunately poured my self-worth into. So you have an opportunity to change your mindset and to recognize that you can be more positive with yourself because what you say after I am is truly what you become and you act consistent with who you think you are. And so you have an opportunity to start rewiring your brain to begin to see the positives about you. Society often encourages us to be negative. We're often comparing ourselves to other people, to our friends, to our colleagues, to our family members. And right, we always do feel like we aren't good enough or that our stories don't matter, or that we don't have value. We might think a lot of these really negative and heavy things. But then when you do that, again, you carry yourself differently, but you also might attract more negative people and opportunities to you. And so instead, when you can start having the power of positivity within you, it can help to change your life. It made such a difference for me in my healing journey. It's something I wish I had that would allowed me to have more patience and grace and compassion with myself through the struggle that I had with my mental health. Being positive with yourself doesn't mean being positive 100% of the time. Positivity and self-love are so intertwined. And so what it's about, it's about doing the work. It's about taking the space in every day when you have negative thoughts coming into your mind, trying your best to cloud those out and to put into a positive thought. And then maybe you get out and you're, you have a big presentation you have to do for your colleagues, or you have a really big project coming up that you're unsure of. And you say to yourself, I can do this. I've done the work. And then maybe you don't do as well as you wanted to. That happens. Being positive and having self-love doesn't mean that you're going to 100% reach your goals 100% of the time. But what self-love and positivity allows you to do is it allows you to come back and sit in that feeling, that regret, that sadness, that disappointment. We wanna sit in that feeling and know that that feeling is valid. We don't wanna push it off because that's when our problems grow and grow. But recognizing we can sit in that feeling and then we can say to ourselves, this might be really hard and challenging and I don't like this feeling, but I know that I'm worthy of trying again and again and again. And that is what self-love and the power of positivity is about. It's about what you say to yourself after when you didn't do as well. If you're continuously beating yourself up and saying, I'm a failure, I should have never gotten up there in the first place, then you're going to have a lot more fear and anxiety the next time you have to do it. Other than reminding yourself, I'm only human. I made a mistake. I'm only human. I didn't reach that goal 100%, but I know that I can try again. I know that I've had hard times before in the past and I have gotten through them. I know that every single day I show up and I do the best that I possibly can. I know that part of that means using my voice and saying that I'm not okay. And this is where the power of self-love and positivity comes in. 
And it's been so incredibly helpful for me through my journey. And I really want you all to leave here with this powerful and positive tool that is so quick and easy to do that you can do absolutely anywhere, including when you're driving, that can be so helpful to start to rewire your brain and start to help you to think differently. And it's honestly one of the best acts of rebellion towards society to be able to say, I may not be who you want me to be. I may not be who you expect me to be, but I'm going to be me. And of course, that means I'm going to love myself and do better and be better in different situations, but I'm going to love myself through all of those changes. Again, recognizing that you have all gone through so many different things in your life, depending on the different identities that have shaped you, the identities that will continue to shape you and the experiences that you have. No matter what anybody has said to you or what will, they will say to you or the expectations or pressures that you're under, knowing that you are all of these things on the screen and so much more, that you are worthy and talented and smart and capable and can truly do anything you want in this world if you begin to believe in yourself and the person that you are. And so in this world that often is full of negativity, I want us to leave here in my portion of your time with us today of being able to have the power of positivity together. And so what we're going to be able to do is say these affirmations together. So what I'll do is I will say the first affirmation, and then you are going to go in the chat and you're going to repeat it after me. I know I can't see, uh, hear you or see you today, but I know that you're going to be saying it out loud at the same time that you're typing. And then I'll say the second affirmation, you'll put it in the chat and we'll do that for all three. Awesome. So the first one is I am worthy. Go ahead into the chat box. Awesome. I see them coming in. The next one is I am capable. Perfect. I love seeing them coming in. And the last one is I am good enough. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Good job. So we have spent the last hour together, uh, half hour together talking about mental health and so many incredible stories that have been shared this morning. And I think we can do that one more time and get a lot louder than that in the chat box by having exclamation points and capital letters, because I want us to leave here today knowing that who we are in this moment, no matter what we've gone through is more than good enough. I want us to truly feel the power of these affirmations and leave here knowing that this is a small and mighty tool that can make a difference. So I'm gonna get loud, I need the extra positivity. I know you're gonna get loud saying it out loud today to the, as well, and you're gonna go in the chat box with exclamation points. So take two. So I am worthy, exclamation points, capital letters, I see them coming in. I am capable, amazing, amazing. And this last one, I want you to put your entire heart into knowing that who you are in this moment is more than good enough. I am good enough, amazing, amazing. I love the energy, I love the energy. Take that with you, take that with you and know that who you are in this moment is worthy and capable and that I'm fighting for you just like I continue to fight for me every single day. So I thank you all so much for your time today and for allowing me to share my story with you. I'm so happy to be back with Riverside. We have a couple of minutes for questions. So if you wanna use the Q&A box, if you have questions from your, my time with you all this morning, feel free to use the Q&A box to ask any questions. My contact information is also on the screen if you have um, any questions that you wanna ask me in the future. And then also, I know a couple of you will leave here with my book today, but if you're interested in getting a copy, building off what I talked about, my the link is on the screen. Awesome, thank you everybody. Feel free to ask any questions. We'll have a couple minutes for questions. Okay, we only have time for one question. Um, so let's see if there's one that comes in. Maybe we'll hold it for like five more seconds and see if there's any questions that came in. And then if not, sorry, if there you do have a question you think of maybe in a couple of minutes, just feel free to just quickly take down my contact information um, and, and then, yeah. Thanks everyone. Please welcome Louie Mackey, Chair of Riverside's Power of Lived Experience Employee Resource Group. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your message, your tools, and your story, Ivy. And thank you everyone who has taken the time today to be vulnerable and tell us more about yourselves. As the chair of Riverside's employee resource group, The Power of Lived Experience, or POLL for short, 
I wholeheartedly believe these opportunities to have deeper professional discussions about the intricacies of our lives work towards the destigmatization of these experiences. As a Riverside employee who is queer, neurodivergent, and have my own mental health experiences, it is important that we embrace the diverse backgrounds we live every day and deserve the freedom to bring our full, authentic selves to the world. Here at Poll, we aim to foster a community of cultural sensitivity that promotes psychological safety for employees who have personal or close family experience navigating the realms of mental health or substance use challenges, for employees with personal experience of being neurodivergent, and any Riverside employee interested in learning how to participate in the development of a more diverse and inclusive workplace for the people in these communities. If you are at all interested in attending poll, we meet virtually on Microsoft Teams the last Thursday of every month from 3 to 4 p.m. And you can get an invite by emailing poll at riversidecc.org and be placed on the mailing list. I also want to encourage all Riverside employees wanting to know more about poll and Riverside's three other employee resource groups, join us in person for ERG Fest on Friday, November 3rd, from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. in the main conference hall at 270 Bridge Street in Dedham. Come meet ERG leadership and membership, enter to win some free raffle baskets, come prepared with any and all questions about ERGs, and have a free lunch on us. We look forward to seeing you there, and thank you everyone for your time today. Please welcome Emily Bliss, Chair of Riverside's newest ERG, True Ability. Hello, my name is Emily Bliss. I'm a dog mom, a member of the Riverside community as a team member for our CBHC, and a person with a chronic illness called lupus. All of these things are part of my identity, affect how I interact with people, and how I engage in my work. I found peers at work who have similar experience um, and teamed up with another Riverside employee, Brianna Bowering, to charter a new employee resource group, True Ability. True Ability is a re Riverside employee resource group for individuals living with or touched by chronic, invisible, and visible illnesses and disabilities to share their experience and to help others understand the experience of living with a chronic illness. True Ability is open to any Riverside employee looking to find a community support for living with being touched by a chronic illness or disability. True Ability meets the second Wednesday of every month at 2 p.m. via Zoom. We invite any interested Riverside employee to join us. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at trueability at riversidecc.org. Thank you for your time and commitment to making Riverside an inclusive place to work. And now to announce the winners of our giveaway, please welcome Nick Hansel Snyder, Chair of Riverside's Employee Resource Group, the LGBTQ plus crew. Hi everyone. Thank you so much to everyone for sharing your story today. It's really been amazing. And the amazingness continues with our giveaway. We have four wonderful packages to give away. Each includes a signed copy of Ivy's book, You Are Worth Fighting For, Your Guide to Finding Mental Wellness and Self-Love, plus an at-home spa kit and more. Our winners were randomly selected from today's attendees and you do need, still need to be here in the Zoom with us in order to win. So as I announce the names, please give a shout out in the chat to confirm. And we'll be in touch to sort out the details of getting your prize uh, via email. So without further ado, our winners are Kevin Becker, Akansha Joshi, Kimberly Bailing, and Aaron Stone. I'll say those again. If you can just quick do a quick hi in the chat so we know you heard and we can know you're going to get your, your giveaway uh, basket. Kevin Becker, Akansha Joshi, Kimberly Bailing, and Aaron Stone. I'm not seeing any messages. Are all four of these folks not here with us? Oh, Akansha. Okay, we got one winner. All right, we're going to move on to our second slate of backup winners for the folks who aren't here. 
So let's see here. We have uh, Maritza Jacobs, Tom Hall, and Kareen Danielle Manig Monagot. Sorry, I probably horribly mispronounced your name. Are any of these folks here? Okay, Maritza, winner number two. Do we, is Tom Hall here or Kareen Danielle Manigat? No, all right. I'm gonna go to my third list, which is as far out as I pulled names. So hopefully someone else is here for this, this the last couple of groups. We have Fred Brissett and Anne Priestley. Okay, third winner and fourth winner. All right, we have our winners. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much. Please welcome once again, Dr. Angela Crutchfield. I think I can never find the right words to end these type of events. I really just wanna say thank you. Thank you to the leaders and the staff of Riverside for participating in today's event. You know, the power of lived experience really it, it just showed up in, in strong ways today. There's power in our voice. There's power in our experiences. Ivy Watts, thank you. You are amazing. Thank you for sharing. BHMA Classical Ensemble, thank you so much for joining us today. To our Riverside's uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, specifically Louis Mackey, Tarshi Derival, uh, Nick Hansel-Snyder, and uh, uh, Anna Stanish. Standish, thank you so much, all of you, for your support and help and partnership to make this event happen and all of the planning behind the scenes. It takes a lot for us to pull these together, but they're coming together, and we really appreciate all of the, the work that goes into it. Aaron, uh, Rebecca, Jake, uh, you know, Nick, your technical support, it continues to make me smile. <laughs> I can't do these things without you all. Thank you so much. And to our Riverside marketing team, thank you for your partnership and support. And finally, I say thank you to each of you who joined us here today. Without you, we wouldn't even have the event. So your presence is significant in our efforts to ensure educational opportunities, engagement, and also a little entertainment and a few gifts along the way all a part of our efforts to be a more culturally competent organization where we are considerate of all people and valuing everyone for who they are. So thank you all so much for your support and everything that you've done to be a part of this event today. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much.